Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Vivian Schiller, and I'm the Executive Director of Aspen Digital. We are a program of the Aspen Institute that focuses on everything at the intersection of technology, uh, the internet, media, and the big issues of our times, which is what we're here to talk about certainly today. The news that Roe v. Wade may be reversed has really set off a series of shockwaves that I think we're only just beginning to understand. One of the most sinister implications of Roe going away, however, has to do with our everyday digital tools and how they can be turned against people who may be seeking an abortion. The data generated by period tracking apps, social media posts, location data sales, web search histories, and more really tell, reveal our personal stories. They tell the stories about who we are and what we're up to. This is not new. Uh, but it is newly relevant and newly uh, potentially implemented uh, in, uh, in, in ways that could really harm people who are seeking uh, uh, abortions. These unregulated digital forensic tools have already been used often, and especially on immigrant populations and racial justice advocates for a long time. Like I said, the end of Roe brings a new set of risks to a new set of people. Today, we brought together a group of experts in civil rights and digital privacy to explain the risks and what can be done, both at an individual and a systemic level, to protect the personal health decisions of all Americans. After an initial discussion with our experts, who I will introduce momentarily, we will be joined by Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon, a longtime advocate for digital privacy and transparency of government surveillance operations. Uh, after he speaks, uh, we will begin to take questions from you, the audience. So what you uh, can do at any time, starting even right now, is at the bottom of your screen, click the Q&A button, uh, and you can enter your question there. If you feel comfortable doing so, please add your name and affiliation. It just provides context. If you don't want to add your name and affiliation, that is totally fine. Okay, so let's get on with our program. Um, let me just talk a little bit about our three panelists. They are uh, Tiffany Lee. Uh, she is assistant professor at University of New Hampshire School of Law, where she teaches internet law and constitutional law. She's an expert on privacy, artificial intelligence, and technology platform governance. We have also with us uh, Wefe Ben Hassin. She is principal on the responsible technology team at Omidyar Networks, focusing on privacy and trustworthy messaging platforms. Previously, she was the Middle East and North Africa policy manager for Access Now. And finally, we have with us Cynthia Conti Cook. She is a technology fellow on gender, racial, and ethnic justice at the Ford Foundation, where she focuses on the potential use of technology to criminalize people who seek or aid abortions and the expanding use of surveillance technology against immigrant communities. And in fact, uh, first of all, welcome to all of you, but Cynthia, um, I'm gonna start with you. So we want you to give us a little bit of context. So the leaked opinion set off uh, conversations, a lot of conversation about what digital, digital surveillance could mean post row. But the reality is that digital forensic tools such as location data, search histories are already being used to track people. So give us a sense of the current landscape and how it might come into play in discussions around abortion. Sure. Thank you, Vivian, and thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here today with my co-panelists. It is very true. There's a lot of buzz around what our sci-fi future looks like, but I hate to say that what we are perhaps imagining as our potential future has already been past and present for many people who live in Black and brown communities in the United States. And we know that prosecutors have already introduced digital evidence in cases where pregnant people were accused of conduct related to the termination of their pregnancies. That type of information was taken from not any type of fancy surveillance technology, but from their digital devices, from their smartphones. The information taken from their smartphones included basic Google searches, text messages, emails that were not encrypted, as well as in some cases also um, websites that have been visited. That is how um, 
that is what has already been presented as evidence in court in the context of cases against pregnant people, specifically accused of conduct related to terminating pregnancies, has already happened. And did that lead to any prosecutions? Yes, it led to a handful of prosecutions. One was in Indiana, one was in Mississippi. Those are the ones that we know about. It is certainly possible that there have been more. It is absolutely routine for digital evidence to be introduced into criminal and immigration court systems. It is um, a technology that is not only um, available to law enforcement, it is available to schools, other types of state agencies, and it is also purchasable. Yeah. So I want to get into a little bit about how we how uh, various entities access that uh, that data. So Tiffany, let me come to you. So when it comes to collecting, storing, and possibly handing over data to law enforcement, uh, a lot of that data is uh, is uh, happens has been collected on platforms belonging to Google, which of course includes YouTube, or platforms belonging to Meta, which of course includes Facebook, Instagram. Uh, and WhatsApp. And then, of course, we've got TikTok in play. So talk to us a little bit about um, what role they play and a little bit about what must they turn over, what can they refuse, and just how that works in general. So I think if any of you have read a privacy policy, pretty much every major company has a small portion at the very end of the policy that says something like, our lawful request policy. Um, and that has terms that says what the company is going to do if they get a sort of law enforcement request, exactly like you mentioned. So something that says, you know, we need all the data on this person related to her menstrual cycle or her fertility planning. And then usually the company, um, depending on what kind of request is made, uh, if it's not a warrant, it's not a warranted request, they can relatively freely choose to not comply with it. Um, I say relatively because even if you're not legally bound to comply with something, there are sometimes other enforcement pressures, right? If you as a company are known as the one that doesn't play well with law enforcement, that's not ideal uh, for most companies. So there is some of that um, extra legal pressure. Um, but then if there is a warrant, right, if there's actual legal um, bounds, then either the company has to comply, hand over the data, or they have to go through the process of challenging the warrant and challenging the scope of the request. Uh, this is something that companies like Google have done, um, but it's also something that smaller companies might not know how to do or might not have the funds to do. So that's a little bit what happens on the legal back end when a company re receives that kind of request. Usually a lot of analysis about how much it might cost and you know, what do they really want to protect in terms of their users' privacy. And what kind of variability have we seen from judges who are, who are approving those uh, court orders. I assume it really depends on the judge, uh, uh, how aggressive they might want to be in, in asking, in, in, in approving a court order for data, say around collecting information from a period tracking app, uh, whereas others might not agree to it. So talk to us a little bit about that. So it's definitely it can be very variable. Um, so if you want to have a, you know, a warranted search order, you have to have a judge to approve. Um, so it's going to depend on, you know, which district, which jurisdiction you're in. So you can imagine that this might change on a state by state basis, um, given the political situation in America right now, there might be a slightly different standard to government requests for certain kinds of data related to certain kinds of issues. Um, so it, it's a little different, for example, when you ask for requests for data for something like um, a, an in progress search for a serial killer, right? That's something that's gonna be very high profile. Um, there are very different stakes involved versus something like a, in some states, what would be a much lower stakes investigation um, into someone's personal health choices. So I think it is different by jurisdiction and that's partially a politicized difference. Yeah, it's hard not to see how this is a, a, a significantly um, political issue. Uh, Wefe, talk to us a little bit. So you were, you through your work at Access Now and now at Omidyar, you've seen uh, in other countries what can happen when governments weaponize digital tools to track down protesters or those fighting for human rights. So what have you seen um, uh, outside the United States that are lessons for the way to think about these kind of issues becoming um, more significant in the United States? 
Thank you, Vivian, and thanks to Aspen for having me. I'm really pleased to be here. I think that's a really good question, primarily because um, the amount of lawlessness that we see, particularly with data brokers globally, as well as in the United States, is rather significant. And the situation with the possibility of overturning Roe v. Wade just kind of demonstrates and highlights why it's so important for us to, to move our attention back to the role of data brokers, as well as um, the amount of consent that we have as users. And I really love Tiffany's poster, uh, Data Never Dies, <laughs> because it is entirely correct. Um, and I find it, to be honest, rather fascinating that we're talking about these situations where users are not allowed to give consent for whether or not that data should be collected, sold. Um, in fact, in this particular situation, just between parentheses, uh, we don't even have consent about the decision itself, right? The overturning of Roe v. Wade itself. The majority of Americans, according to several surveys, uh, do not support the overturning of Roe v. Wade. I think it's about um, 61% and a majority of those people, 56 of them strongly oppose overturning Wade. So this is all about users, about people not giving consent to something um, and then having the long-term slippery slope implications of what that means. And we've seen that, as you mentioned, globally, we've seen it, um, this intersection of three main things, I would say, the intersection of digital technologies, these, the intersection of stigma and surveillance, all in one kind of coalescing into one data point. Um, and we saw that happen, for instance, in Egypt, both in 2014 and 17, where, um, and there is the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights did an investigation on this, and they've uncovered that police officers in the country were using Grindr, which is a, a queer friendly, LGBT friendly application, a dating application to essentially uh, hunt and trap and later imprison uh, different users that were on the platform. And, and you know, it, I think this application in particular allows users to interact with one another based on uh, location data. So they'd be able to, if you're interested in, in seeing somebody, then you'd be able to see their profile um, within their proximity. And to display this application does display the distances that is between both of those users. And so what happened in Egypt on several occasions is that police officers use this application to find, essentially hunt people to take them to jail. Uh, this is very serious. And, and I do want to bring it back to the United States as well, because um, a couple of years ago, I believe Vice uncovered a situation where the U.S. Army was buying data from a company um, named Babel Street. Uh, which sells a product named Locate X to harvest information from an Islamic prayer app. And um, they were using that in a counterterrorism effort. Uh, and, and at times they would buy the data itself, such as uh, through a company, uh, or at times they would also buy a product to harvest that data. So this is, this is not something that um, will just impact women, it'll impact everybody. And the, the consequences of such a decision from a technological point of view are, are very great. Yeah, I mean, certainly people don't know that every time they they play a, a random game, download a new app, uh, that their you know their data is being collected and and might fall into the hands of these data brokers. Explain what a data broker is and how that works exactly. Data broker is essentially somebody who's in the middle, who uh, is the it's the middleman, so to speak. You would have an application that collects the data, then you would have the data broker that would have that data from the application and be able to sell it to interested parties who uh, would be able to, to buy it. Um, I believe there was a motherboard who recently uncovered that they were able to uh, buy abortion related data, which I, my fellow panelists will speak a lot about as well, um, completely above water, completely legally. Uh, you know, and this is, this is something that we have spoken about many times in the past, but not enough attention institutionally has been given to the problem. Um, uh, Cynthia, let me come back to you. So when it comes to law enforcement accessing this data, what needs to be accessed through a physical device? Like, is this about somebody needing to, do they need to actually access my physical phone or laptop? Uh, or can a lot of this data be uh, remotely accessed, um, you know, again, with, uh, with a subpoena court order through data brokers or through, the, through cloud-based systems? Both, really. In the cases that I have looked at, it is most common for someone to be in the middle of an investigation by a police department and perhaps even in a very casual way, the police officer in that interview, which they might not even be calling an investigation or doing at the precinct might say, hey, could you wouldn't mind if I saw your phone, right? You have nothing on your phone. And 
when someone would say that to me, I know I might think like, sure, have at it, look through my phone, good luck scrolling through months worth of something and finding anything interesting to you. But that is not um, the type of power they have. They have a great deal of power through digital extraction forensics tools, which I refer everyone to Upturn's report mass extraction from 2020 for more details on how those digital forensic devices uh, operate and how widespread they are and how unregulated they are. But when law enforcement gets their hands on a physical device, on a on a iPad or on a smartphone or something, the ability of those those extraction tools pushes out not just you know a replica of your phone that they have to go through. It pushes out something that's keyword searchable, image searchable. They can map your uh, information onto a geographic map, onto a social network in chronological order. They can do a whole lot to digest that information so that it is very simple for them to go to. And after they have it, there is no regulation or limit to how they store it or who they share it with or what they use it for next. And in fact, there was a case last year in Wisconsin where a court found that it was perfectly acceptable for a police department in a different county for a different crime from a different sheriff's department to use data that was extracted with someone's consent for a completely different situation. And so we know that they're sharing the information with each other at the very least. So it opens up the possibility of sort of fishing expeditions once the data is in hand. Not just fishing expeditions, but it is um, you know, certainly possible that there is, uh, the information is being shared in ways that we have really yet to wrap our heads around. Yeah. Um, uh, Tiffany, let, let me come to you. And, and I think we're going to be joined by Senator Wyden in just a moment. But let me get this uh, question into you bef uh, before um, we bring him on. There's been a lot of discussion about the need for a federal privacy law that would protect people from this kind of data mining and exploitation. What's the chance of that happening? I mean, I think that it's coming. I think it's coming. Um, I think we need to continue putting pressure um, to get it to happen, but we're beyond the time when we needed a federal privacy law. Uh, we're behind so many countries now. The EU's GDPR is leading the way. America is behind, and that's hurting not just you know the people, but also even our tech industry too. So I definitely think it's definitely time for a federal privacy law. Yeah. Well, and we'll we'll see if um, uh, the senator brings that up as well. Uh, Wefe, uh, you know, many vulnerable populations are already facing increased levels of surveillance, particularly immigrant and black communities. So what additional challenges might those at the intersection of those communities and reproductive rights now face in a possible post row world? Uh, well, lower income black and Latino women are certainly uh, bound to pay the price here. I think that they're disproportionately affected by these restrictions. We've already seen this impact um, in two particular types of situations. Uh, situations. Well, the first is when uh, a woman is traveling to receive uh, medical care for an abortion. And the second case is when a woman is forced to have uh, a pregnancy. So the case of forced pregnancies. Now, in the first uh, scenario, when uh, a woman is traveling for abortion, we've already seen that once Texas passed its law uh, and its ban, uh, travel costs for women has actually risen, have risen more than 30% in, uh, in clinics in Texas and nearby states have started to fill up essentially uh, with clients and patients that are regularly regularly traveling more than uh, over a thousand miles for an abortion. And of course, um, they would typically go to California, New York, Colorado, or other states that uh, would support a woman's right to, uh, you know, have maintain her reproductive health in her own hands. And this, this particular type of uh, disproportionate impact is, of course, felt by women who are less likely to have the funds and ability to travel or to get time off of work to do so to get that out of state care. Um, and the second situation is in the case of forced pregnancies. So for women who are forced to go through an unwanted pregnancy, the result can be a lifetime of poverty. And we've seen this through uh, about half of the women that seek to actually end the pregnancy already, are, already live below the poverty line. And with three quarters of those women are struggling to pay for basics like food, housing, uh, rent, et cetera. And, uh, and two, two more things I did want to bring up is that five years after a woman is uh, denied an abortion, studies have shown that women are four times as likely 
to live below the federal poverty line once again. And after a decade, they are had higher likelihoods of having bankruptcies, evictions, lower credit scores. So this is not just a woman not being able to receive an abortion. This is an impact on her daily living life for the rest of her life. And this is primarily felt by women who do not have access to resources to begin with. Well, we're, we're starting to see uh, slowly, um, you know, uh, uh, companies stepping up and, and, and saying that they will pay for their employers travel costs and give them the time off to travel out of state uh, if they live in a state that uh, it, where abortion is restricted to be able to travel to a state where it is still allowed. But of course, that's not necessarily the kind of benefit that's going to be accessible to many people below the poverty line. And I might add, it will further there, there's uh, that also wouldn't necessarily uh, uh, protect somebody from prosecution. I mean, it will help the, for the financial burden. But uh, as we know, and more and more states are, are beginning to look at um, criminalizing travel out of state for the purposes of an abortion. So that gets a little bit uh, tricky. So I'm going to pause on the conversation with the three of you because we um, have now been uh, joined by uh, Senator Ron Wyden. Um, we are so appreciative that you could spend um, a few minutes with us. And um, we'd love to give you the floor uh, to talk about this critical issue about uh, digital uh, data extraction and surveillance, in uh, particularly in the context of a potential post row world. Senator, welcome. Can, thank you. Can you hear me now? Perfectly. Very good. Well, I so appreciate you having this program. It's been more than a week since the American people learned that the Alito court is going to overturn Roe. And I don't think we can kid ourselves about who's in charge of the court right now. And obviously, there is tremendous anger. Uh, that's been the case since the news broke. And uh, millions of Americans are just plain, and simple, straightforward, fearful. The Alito court is going to roll the clock back on women's freedom and women's privacy by a full century. Now, they do this in spite of the fact that overturning Roe is deeply unpopular. Republicans would get thrown out of office if they did it in the Congress. So Mitch McConnell set out to pack the court with people on the far right so that they would do it instead. And we want to make sure as this discussion goes forward, that we're clear-eyed about what's next. Right now, at the state and local level, where there has been so little public accountability because local media has been obliterated, lawmakers are talking about truly draconian infringement on women's freedom and privacy. What they've already done and what they're planning to massively expand is criminalizing abortion even bans on birth control. This is a extraordinary encroachment on Americans' personal lives. It's a direct attack on the idea that in a free society, everybody ought to have control over their own bodies. Now, obviously, there are a host of frightening issues stemming from that. And one that I'm particularly pleased you're focused on is the question of digital privacy of women in uh, America. And I've been sounding the alarm for years that location data leached from phone apps is ripe for abuse. In a world where extremists make abortion illegal, that goes straight to a five alarm crisis. Shady data brokers are out and these are people that are literally above the law. There really is no accountability over these sleazy data brokers and they're tracking women to and from Planned Parenthood centers, number of them selling their information to anybody with a credit card. That in my view is the beginning. When abortion is legal, anything women say or read online can be used against them. Researching birth control online, updating a period tracking app or carrying a phone to the doctor's office, you name it. Any of that data can and will be used to track and prosecute women across the country. What's being discussed is uterus surveillance, encouraged and exploited by the government, enabled by shady, shady data brokers and what are literally bounty hunters. 
for Americans who believe in protecting liberty and the right to privacy. This is out of the nightmare that you hear about from totalitarian regimes. It's essentially a, the government weaponizing women's data, using it against them. So I think what I'll do is close with uh, a clear statement about what needs uh, to happen. Now, it starts with keeping up the fight to pass a law, codifying Roe. We're working on that right now, this afternoon in the Senate. And clearly, Republicans are trying to block that from happening this week. But that must not be the end of the effort. People who believe in liberty, privacy, and women's rights need to do everything we can to get more supporters, more Democrats elected to Congress in November. Next, the Congress has to get serious about putting in place baseline privacy protections. That means passing a consumer privacy law to restrict how Americans' private data is collect, collected, used, and shared. Reducing the amount of sensitive data that the companies hold and the number of companies that have that data will also make it harder for radical right-wing prosecutors to sift through private records, control women's private decisions that way. Second, I have a bipartisan piece of legislation called the Fourth Amendment is not for sale. It would prohibit the government from buying information from data brokers rather than getting a warrant. Passing my bill would make it harder for Republican states to buy up big databases of information without warrants and then hunt down women seeking an abortion. Third, the Congress needs to protect Section 230, which preempts state laws when it comes to online speech. Now, 230 is very likely that websites and social media companies would be deluged with lawsuits and forced to take down information about how to have an abortion, even in states where it's legal. So I hope that you all will see that not only is the Alito majority steering us and our country in a frightening direction, we know we're always most uh, optimistic when our country is a land of freedom and, and liberty where men and women enjoy a right to privacy. And Sam Alito says, nothing doing. We're going to turn back the clock on privacy. So I do think this all translates to uterus surveillance. I think it's coming. It's coming unless people of goodwill and good faith around the country stand up to it. And I thank you all for having me uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Have, you. have you got time just for a quick uh, follow-up question? Sure. I wanted to ask you specifically on your three recommendations, just to laser focus on number two, which is the focus of our program today, which is about uh, data, data uh, uh, brokers and data uh, surveillance. What is the likelihood of that uh, legislation uh, making its way? How, is this going to happen? It's yeah. I've, I've had conversations just in the last hour with senior members of Congress. We have bipartisan support for this bill, bipartisan bill in both the Senate and the House. And the idea of letting these data brokers basically go out and just buy up people's you know, rights and basically just use their credit card when they ought to be getting uh, a, a warrant, um, I think it's just critically important. When the government buys information from data brokers, rather than getting you know, a warrant, you have a prescription for trouble. And you know, right now, you've got the government buying up that uh, in information and uh, these, uh, these data brokers have got a, got a sweet deal. And what we do is make it harder for Republican states to buy up big databases of information without warrants. It brings back the warrant process and doesn't, uh, in effect, create a situation where somebody's credit card takes the place of a, takes the place of a, of a warrant. Are there any other paths towards uh, solving for this issue in the event that legislation is not passed? Well, I, I do think protecting Section 230 is a very strong action because that's not something that requires a law. I'm one of the authors of Section 230. 
it stipulates that the person who developed the content is the one responsible for the content. And uh, it preempts state laws when it comes to online speech. And a lot of these you know, state laws are in places where um, it won't be legal to get an abortion. So I think that this is, this is critically important. We wanna uh, protect 230 because that's an existing law that's on the books. And it's always easier to protect something rather than to pass a new law. But I do believe that you know, the Fourth Amendment not being you know, for sale, prohibiting the government from just buying up everything in sight from data brokers instead of getting, getting a warrant. I mean, I don't think the founding fathers thought people's constitutional rights were supposed to be built on credit cards. I thought it was supposed to be about getting a warrant. Thank you so much, Senator. Um, really appreciate you uh, lending us your time this afternoon. We know you need to get back to work, but thank you very, very much for joining us. You're welcome to stick around, but we're going to um, go on to the program to take some other questions. I'm, I'm, I'm on. I'm on to vote for codifying Roe versus Wade. It's going to be a heck okay. Of a we'll go back thanks, to work. Okay. Thanks, thanks, for, what, thanks for what yeah. you're doing. Okay. Thank you so much, and stick around, everybody. We're saying goodbye to the senator, but we're going to keep going, and we are uh, going to begin to move towards your questions now. We have. Um, a number of questions come in, but please, anytime, just drop them right into, uh, again, bottom of your screen, Q&A button, just click, drop it in. If you uh, feel comfortable with your name and affiliation, um, please add that. We're going to start with a question um, from Ted Perlmutter. He's a lecturer at the Institute for the Study of Human Rights at Columbia. Uh, his question is, how accurate is GPS location data for individuals based on smartphones? I've heard everything from one to five uh, meters. Are there any good studies? Um, I don't know if anybody on, on um, our panel can address the issue about uh, GPS and um, its, uh, its accuracy uh, and effectiveness, frankly, in, in, a, in a bad way for this kind of surveillance. I'm definitely not an expert in this issue, but I would say that if you look at studies on cell site simulators and how they have operated as well as studies on digital forensics in general, it might give us a better idea. It depends on how many cell sites are in an area. So for example, in New York City where there are tall buildings and the pings to cell towers are sort of, um, they bounce off of buildings. It can be um, a little off sometimes because the, uh, the signal sort of bounces and it's maybe within a few, you know, a little bit larger than a five meter uh, type of accuracy, but it really depends on the distribution of your cell sites and um, how many phones are trying to ping yeah. off of them. A, a, a related question I'm going to uh, follow on with that, this one from Patricia Elmore is how would it, would a, how would a woman or, or frankly any person seeking an abortion ever know if their uh, tech device or their family's device were being used for surveillance purposes. Is there a way that you can be aware uh, that, well, I think we can all assume that data is being collected, um, but would they be aware of, uh, you know, perhaps a court order for that data or, uh, or that the da a data broker is selling their data? Help us understand what's knowable by the consumer. I'm throwing it open to whoever thinks they could best answer that question. Go ahead, Tiffany. Great. Um, I mean, I think all my co-panelists can answer these questions. Um, I'm, I love being on this panel with so many experts on this topic. Um, I think a few things. Um, first, I want to talk about this, um, the idea of the availability of the data, um, depending on, you know, where you are. Um, like Cynthia just mentioned, I think one thing to consider is also this idea of sustained surveillance. So you might have um, location data from one day. Um, and maybe that location data is only accurate within five meters. Um, but if you have location data over a period of time, if you're tracking someone through multiple different devices over a year, say, um, then you have a really much more complete picture of what's going on. And that's part of the issue that's here in terms of privacy. And another part of that issue, which as you mentioned is related, is the fact that you might not even know. Um, there is a lot of 
there are many cases involving people who have had um, often intimate partners um, download spyware on their phones, um, stalkerware, so software that runs in the background um, that you know tracks what where you're going, tracks what you're sending, what you're saying. Um, usually software that is designed uh, to make it difficult for the user to actually see it. So the phone owner or the device user. That's really concerning. Um, that's something that exists right now and is hard for people, especially people who are not very tech uh, savvy to figure out. And thinking of just you know, data brokers again, it's extremely hard for any individual to know where your data is going and who's selling it and who's buying it. Um, I can see right now, I have very little idea. I mean, I know at the first point when I sign up for a new service or a new app, when I click yes, the terms and conditions like you all, uh, but after that, what happens? You can follow, maybe look at the privacy policy, see where that website sells your data. You could then follow, I guess, the next website, right? If you really were to go down this rabbit hole, um, it would take you so much time. It's really out of the bounds of the average consumer. And that's part of the problem. And that's why we need to create some sort of regulation about for data brokers. So, so, uh, so given that it's, it's, it's hard for you to know what's being tracked, what might have been, um, up, uh, you know, uh, uploaded onto your device, what, uh, what's being sold, what should, uh, again, not just women, but all people do, what, what kind of uh, digital protections or tools should people uh, consider? What are some, what is very, very practical advice to protect yourself from these various uh, data exposure threats? Um, Wefa, you want to jump in on, on this one? I mean, the, the, the easy and lazy thing is to leave your phone at home, but that's not always uh, applicable. <laughs> not it's happening. not always possible. <laughs> it's, it's really not always possible. Um, I think our, I mean, my hope is that Roe v. Wade does not get overturned and the senator's comments on uh, legislation and codifying Roe v. Wade do go through. Um, but it, I think the at this stage, I think one of the primary problems is that we don't know when our information is being collected and we don't know when it's being sold. Um, there's There are some uh, services online, like I think there's one that's, that's called Delete Me, where it searches through all sorts of different data brokers uh, along the lines of what information they have about you, whether it's your phone number, whether it's your your physical mailing address, which by the way, could also be obtained uh, if you're if you're inserting that type of information into the application or with your uh, with the provider that you're seeing for your for your health, um, especially when it's not related to um, a directly medical uh, health application, which would be covered under HIPAA. And so, uh, I think, yeah, I think one of the problems as it stands is that we would not know, right? There are no real practical ways to figure out what information is out there about me that is being held by private hands. Um, and uh, is being traded, sold, bought without my consent whatsoever. Anybody else, either Tiffany or Cynthia, any acts, very specific practical tips of how you can protect your uh, personal data? Yes. Or delete it. Think about your data and your digital devices as extensions of yourself. Think about bodily and digital autonomy in the same sentence and don't share your digital devices with law enforcement or caseworkers or social workers or healthcare professionals or anyone other than the people that you trust um, very, very clearly. Other really simple things is to already get comfortable downloading those encrypted email and encrypted messaging apps. Use them casually, use them to say hi to mom, use them and pull all your contacts in them now so that you know how they work and you're comfortable with them. And if you're in a moment of crisis, you don't have to manage the additional crisis of learning new tools. Same thing for anti-fingerprinting browsers, privacy browsers that don't track your, tra your movement from website to website. Get used to them, get used to how they work, have them ready to go and use them anyway. And I also just want to emphasize that this is not something that tech policy or anything tech anything is going to fix. This is a problem caused by uh, the criminalization of survival and the criminalization of uh, abortion. Tiffany, anything I, you want to add? Uh, I have just one very quick tip. Um, if any of you don't have passwords on your phones and devices, 
please put a password on your phone and other mobile devices. Uh, we have a variety of cases that um, provide some precedent um, showing that police cannot uh, force you to give your password or force you to sign into your phone. Uh, but if your phone has no password, then they might be free to just access it. So super easy. Most of you probably have it already, but if you don't, please put a password on your mobile devices. <laughs> that is always a good tip. And uh, while you're at it, uh, two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication as well. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Janie Thompson, uh, uh, who writes, do promising technology options exist to help uh, enable more awareness for consumers who may not be tech savvy that their data may be exploited as they seek reproductive care, i.e. push alerts when they are in the vicinity of a sensitive location? Do we need more research on tools that can help people who are going to sensitive locations or researching for sensitive content to protect themselves. So this is sort of a cousin to the last question, which is when we're talking about um, locations like abortion clinics, um, I'm assuming um, out, you know, that, that somebody may travel to out of state, um, researching those, of course, we're all used to using our digital tools in order to find these services and figure out how we're gonna travel to those, uh, to those destinations or any, anything specific about those locations and those search histories that, that might be helpful. Cynthia? I saw Wi-Fi. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, I'm just, it's, go ahead. it's totally okay, Cynthia. Please yeah. go ahead because my answer would have related to another question. So oh. I'll come back to it. I'll come back to you afterwards. I would say that those are not the tools I would prioritize and that is not the expenditure of energy that I would prioritize. I don't think that we want to spend the next generation doing crisis management and oppression management under these circumstances. We really need to figure out long-term protections for our ability to seek the reproductive health care that we yeah. need. I understand that, but there's also the, there's the long-term, but I think there's uh, no doubt people that have short-term concerns about how their data is being used and how it might affect them immediately, but certainly understand. Um, Wefa, sorry, go ahead. I wanted to highlight one of the questions that was sent in by uh, Zaki, who uh, asked a question on immigrant communities. I don't know if you wanted to answer that, uh, uh, you know, articulate the question first, Vivian, but it was related to one of the answers that Cynthia provided. Oh, okay, great. Um, which one? I think Zaki had two questions in there. Yes. Sorry, for those of you that can't see the chat, we're looking at the questions sure. around the um, uh, immigrant community. So yes. Zeki, uh, Zeki Barzinji, part of the Aspen Institute, in what ways are immigrant communities already being subjected to digital surveillance, especially along the borders? Can the same massive systems being built to create the digital border wall also be adapted to build a digital abortion ban? Yes, yeah, so I, I did want to kind of, touch on that and in relation to the answer that Cynthia provided on not handing uh, police officers or you know medical providers your phone I think that's a stellar piece of advice uh, and I would recommend that for everybody that does not live within 100 miles of a U.S. border because um, when that is the case uh, the ICE essentially they have their uh, they have very wide-ranging investigations their homeland security investigations where um, they are able to essentially they have the right to access any information on an electronic device like cell phones, you know, laptops, um, even, you know, little USB drives, as well as social media accounts without any type of warrant. And so um, these kinds of uh, investigations are oftentimes very overbroad. They are unaccountable. Um, they are open ended. They don't really answer to anyone, to be honest. And so uh, I think, of course, immigrant communities do need to be especially careful um, when it comes to the protection of the digital devices and not trusting, uh, not inputting their data um, in different types of applications. I would even go out and say that the type of browser that any individual uses is usually, it would it'd be better to use DuckDuckGo, for example, which does not collect information when you make searches or, you know, just to kind of, and, and along with what Cynthia said as well about using encrypted messaging, make that part of your everyday life, right? And, um, and to answer Zaki's question more directly, yes, yes, yes. Like the immigrant communities will be more directly impacted. Um, these, these tracking systems already exist. Uh, the, this technology already exists. It's just that the possibility of overturning Roe v. Wade represents a use case that it, all of that technology could simply be repurposed for this different group. And so um, repurposed as well as refined, as well as um, 
you know, change for, to look for specific aspects of a visit, uh, how often versus how far. These are all small little metrics that appear to be insignificant, but it could actually lead to vastly widely different results insofar as accuracy goes when trying to uh, find people who are trying to access reproductive health care. I might add, by the way, um, for everybody um, watching us right now in the chat, we've dropped in quite a few uh, links to resources that get at some of the questions that we've been talking about, which is what, what can you do um, to protect yourself and, 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 and what specifically are the risks? Um, this next question I think um, probably is best directed at you, Tiffany. It's from um, Caroline Viola who asks, are there any states with more robust privacy laws either already in effect or pending that pros that pose stricter rules for data brokers that would address some of these issues. Oh, Caroline is a first year student at SCU Law. Wonderful. Great question. Great. You get an okay. A, Caroline, sorry. <laughs> I was saying um, great privacy classes at that law school. So definitely something um, you could, should pursue if you're still there. There are definitely state laws that are stronger than what we have federally, mostly because we don't have a federal privacy law. Uh, so California, for example, has a relatively strong state privacy law uh, that creates specific rights for consumers um, and some remedies. Um, Illinois has the Biometric Information Privacy Act, which is a very strong law specifically protecting biometric privacy. So privacy over data that's related to or coming from the body. Um, and that's really relevant in a lot of cases involving things like facial recognition, for example. Uh, facial recognition using a lot of photos may be taken from you know, Facebook or any other website. So you could see where there might be some relevance to some data brokers, right? Data brokers who buy a lot of information um, might be held to stronger standards under these state laws. They might be forced to at least um, comply with requests for data deletion. So that's something that some have argued is a plus of our current system, that some state laws are pretty strong, perhaps stronger than a federal privacy law would be. Um, because you can imagine that when we have to have something that's agreed to um, on a federal level, that's likely going to be a little softer on some of these issues um, in order to get bipartisan consensus. And one concern with a federal privacy law is that maybe we lose a little bit of the special protections the state laws give. So that's really going to depend on how a federal privacy law is written. Um, you know, likely it will um, take precedence over some state laws. Uh, but right now we have a few state laws in the books. And the good thing is, while we have those state laws, many companies will have to comply with them across 50 states um, simply because it's easier to set your compliance thresholds um, company-wide um, instead of trying to do it on a state-by-state -state basis. Easier for most companies anyway. So. We, at least we have the state laws right now. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about the fact that maybe a, you know a, a federal law might have the effect of softening some of the uh, state laws in, in place. Can um, I just add one thing to that, Vivian? Go for it. One important thing to know on the laws that, that Tiffany mentioned is that they often have loopholes for law enforcement. So as long as there are loopholes for law enforcement and abortion is criminalized, those mm. types of protections are not going to prevent your digital evidence from being presented in criminal court. I think that's a great point. Um, a lot of these laws are consumer privacy laws. And generally speaking, even if we have a federal privacy law, it's probably going to be mostly a consumer privacy law. That's also what the senator just mentioned maybe 10 minutes ago. So if we were to find something that would restrict the, the rights of law enforcement to access the data, we might need something a little different. So perhaps something like the, what was it called? The, for the Fourth Amendment is not for sale um, bill, something like that, um, or other restrictions, uh, because you're, you're definitely right. Most of these laws are based on consumer privacy, um, especially I would say the more high profile state laws. What kind of movement are we seeing? Sorry, this is a question from me, which is why I have not attributed a, a name to it. So what kind of movement have we seen um, or where do you see the greatest possibility of movement by the big tech data collectors uh, to try to mitigate for some of these issues? And do you think it's possible that Roe v. Wade uh, might be a trigger for greater action, particularly as their employees uh, you know, become more activists around these issues. 
Tiffany, I, I'll, I'll start with you and then I'd love the others to jump in. Sure. Um, I mean, I do think this is something where tech companies can at least do a little bit, right? Uh, one area in which I would say a lot of tech is sort of in agreement is on the concept of encryption generally. And I think that's something that we can really try to push. Employees can try to push more encrypted communications offered to users, um, as well as internally more policies on perhaps pushing back against government requests. So if you work at a tech company, maybe check around to find if there is a policy, like what are you going to do um, when someone, some law enforcement agency asks you for data pertaining to this issue? Is there a policy in place? Um, and if there is, what is it, right? Is your company ready to actually try to fight a potential warrant for some of this data? Um, and that's something that employees can ask for and advocate for. Sometimes we've seen that being relatively successful at tech companies too. And I think a lot of tech companies have leadership um, and employees who are sort of on the same page and trying to advocate for these issues, but that's certainly not all of them. Who do you think are the best actors here? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, the best actors maybe are the ones who aren't collecting the data to begin with, but. <laughs> yeah, I might let you know, my co-panelists answer that. I think yeah. um, both of you are maybe closer to some of the direct action on this. Yeah. I don't know of any best actors per se for this conversation, but I did want to highlight that it's, you know, people who work at tech companies are not, not everyday people. I mean, it's, it's maybe a certain percentage of the amount of the professional working population. And that's very small. I think the vast majority of women, and once again, it is vulnerable populations of women who are going to be the ones paying the price. And these are the types of individuals that um, unfortunately, do not have access to uh, a holistic healthcare plan that is provided by their employer. They do not have access to uh, easily scheduled PTO to go on uh, travel to access reproductive health care. I mean, these are really, really yeah. um, serious issues. And I think, sure, tech companies can make statements and they could come out and uh, support uh, women in uh, their bodily dignity. Uh, but I, I don't think that's nearly enough. I think it's somewhat, you know, missing the point. I think we need to continue to, there's only so much that, um, for instance, legislation can do. There's only so much that some employers can do, but there is a lot that users themselves can do. And I did want to echo what Tiffany said on using encrypted mess messaging apps. I mean, I think once again, you know, two-factor authentication, encrypted messaging, these are all best practices that should be, you know, part of your everyday life. Um, and I cannot emphasize that enough, the importance of how important that is, or the significance of, of, of taking, using those applications uh, moving forward. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, Faye, I know that's a big area of your focus right now at Omidyar is on encrypted uh, messaging. Is that a zero risk? I mean, for, for everybody listening, if you were using an encrypted messaging app, which most of the messaging apps now, most popular messaging apps are encrypted, uh, does that protect, is that fully, uh, does that fully protect that data from being collected? It depends. So there's no black and white answer here because every, every application is different. I would say not, there's, it's not a majority of the messaging applications that are, that are encrypted at the moment. So we have some of the big players are, uh, messenger, WhatsApp, signal, telegram, uh, Viber. Uh, so they all have varying levels of encryption with the exception of open whis whisper systems, which is used by Signal and, and WhatsApp. And uh, of course, using these applications is preferable than using others simply because it is end-to-end -end encrypted. So nothing within the communication will be uh, revealed to anybody who tries to att attempt accessing it. I would say one of the risks before was and, and then in most of the applications is when you back up your uh, messages on your computer, oftentimes they are backed up without being encrypted. Uh, oftentimes they're saved on the cloud or on a, on a physical hard drive in a non-encrypted format. So that is something that users should really look out for. Um, different, of course, once again, different applications offer different and varying levels of security uh, when it comes to backups as well as the, the end to end encryption itself. Uh, but, but yeah, I would, I would highly advise that you know they they're aware of what the application offers, and and I will be the first to admit that tech companies don't make this very clear. Um, I think more needs to be done in helping explain privacy policies, what the application offers, what it does not, uh, the types <coughs> of protections that users uh, should expect to have, um, and I think a lot more work should be done along those lines by the companies themselves. 
Yeah, without a doubt. Or in some cases, organizations like Signal, that is a foundation. Despite calls for more transparency around what you're agreeing to, it's certainly got a long way to go. I'm sorry, was that Tiffany? Were you about to jump in? It was Cynthia. Or Cynthia, sorry. It's okay. I was only going to add that it's also important to know what the people who you are communicating with have as their settings, because if I... you have your settings set to encrypted um, or no backup, but the person you're communicating with does not, then that information is still going to be available. And listen, the point of this really is, is that there's no way to guarantee that what we are co-creating online with our digital tools is erased forever or never going to be uncovered. <coughs> it is um, only really capable, we are only really capable of shrinking the footprint that we create and making um, law enforcement or companies that are seeking our information or the adversaries that are seeking our information we can try to make it, make them have to work for it, litigate it for it, hack for it, get a warrant for it. We can make them have to put more effort into it. But as things currently stand, there is no perfect way to protect ourselves. And the only way to really uh, seek long-term protection, like I said, is to uh, focus on the fact that we have criminalized healthcare. Yeah. Well, look, I, ha I have to say all of you have provided in, in the last hour so much very useful, you know, uh, information and help both at a personal level and a systemic level. But uh, it strikes me uh, across all of your answers that a this is really complicated and even uh, pretty techie informed um, consumers would have a hard time uh, understanding where their risks are in terms of their digital movements. And, uh, and that uh, Second, there's kind of no way to stop it, short of any kind of um, um, legislation or criminalization of the of of this kind of uh, data collection. Um, so um, I want to just thank all of you as we uh, run up on our uh, on our hour. Um, I really appreciate it. This is a, a story that is ongoing, um, and as we learn about the fate of Roe v. Wade, I'm sure we will be talking about this. In more detail, but the most important thing I think for the for everybody watching right now is to know that these surveillance tools are in place today, and even where um, uh, abortion is not uh, criminalized, there are other ways that your data is being collected and can put you at risk, particularly for uh, communities of color, immigrants, and other marginalized groups. So, Cynthia, Wefa, uh, Tiffany, um, thank you so much, and thanks everybody for. Uh, watching and we'll post a, a link uh, uh, later at uh, our, our at our Twitter feed for if you want to share this session with anyone else. Thank you so much. Thank you.